Welcome to another episode of Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm your host, I'm Dr. Tom Kennedy. Now, this video lecture today is the first in a series I'm doing on cells, both prokaryotes and eukaryotic cells. Now, rather than starting by contrasting the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, which is often what we focus on, how these two cells are different, let's see how they're similar. Let's see how prokaryotes, both bacteria and archaeans, what they share in common with eukaryotic cells. Or another way of stating this is, what do you have in common with the bacteria cell? And it turns out quite a bit. And the reason for that is because we share common ancestry, right? We have a single origin of life or a single origin of cells, and this explains their similarities. This makes sense, of course. I mean, we can thank uh, Theo Dobzhansky for this one, right? Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Of course, as life evolves, we have maintained characteristics going all the way back to the first living organisms on this planet. All right, getting a little ahead of myself here. And that first life, 3.8, 4, 4.1 billion years ago, I know 0.1, 4.1 billion, that 0.1 is 100 million years. That's longer ago than the dinosaurs went extinct, right? But if we think about this very first life on the planet, life evolved as an extension of geological processes. And if we start thinking about our origins from that point of view, that also explains some of the similarities of all life. Now, of course, life began as simply as it could, basically because it had to. And we're, we don't exactly know how life got started or what we would call abiogenesis, but we have a pretty good idea that it may have gotten started in the oceans, you know, around 4 billion years ago, around geological um, structures called an alkaline vent. And I'm not going to get into abiogenesis here, but that was likely the origins of life. What you're seeing here, this is called the Lost City. And the Lost City is a hydrothermal vent way out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And of course, this one is different from the black smokers that were discovered off the Galapagos Island around um, the 1970s. That one was actually discovered in 2000. And um, uh, yeah, we think those were the birthplaces of life. So, life began 4 billion years ago, give or take a 0.1 or 0.2 billion years. I know, give or take a few hundred million years. And we call that last ancestor to all living things, LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. Okay, now that single origin, um, and in fact, we have pretty good reason to believe that we all came from this LUCA, this last universal common ancestor, because of the shared characteristics we have in common. Now, you and I, were eukaryotes. We're the larger, more complex cells. We have a cell nucleus. You know, that's a region that bounds the, the DNA. And we have mitochondria. But the first cells were structurally more simple and typically smaller. And these were, of course, the prokaryotes, which uh, include both bacteria and archaeans. And if you listen to my next series of lectures, you realize that eukaryotic cells likely came from the merger of bacteria and an archaean. Well, wow, that's pretty cool, isn't it? So let's take a look at this. What does all life share in common? These are, of course, Forrester's turns. And it's pretty easy to see what we might share in common with the Forrester's turn, right? I mean, we're eukaryotic cells, we have a backbone, you know, we're all vertebrates, but we're tetrapods. But what about bacteria? What about the prokaryotes? Now, if you go to any intro textbook or you go online and you, you uh, Google, you know, what are common features of all cells, you're going to get basically these four features. The cell membrane, cytoplasm, ribosomes, DNA, and RNA. And of course, this is not incorrect. This is the very, you know, basic textbook answer of what all life shares in common. So let's take a closer look. The cell is the basic unit of life, okay? This is the smallest thing that is a living to carry out all those things it has to do to be alive, right? So the membrane surrounds our cells, separating the interior of the cell 
from this outside environment. And regardless of what kind of cell you are, whether you're a bacteria, an archaean, or a eukaryotic cell, that plasma membrane is made up of phospholipids. And as you might know from my previous lectures, that in bacterium and in eukaryotes, the phospholipid membranes are the same, whereas in archaeans, they are a bit different. And in fact, they're so different that we think that life acquired their membranes twice, once with the bacteria and once with the archaeans. So there it is. All life is made of cells surrounded by some type of phospholipid layer, mostly bilayers. There are exceptions amongst the archaeans. There's even a unilayer in archaean. Okay, now of course, inside of that uh, phospholipid layer, inside that cell membrane, of course, is the cytoplasm. This is the inside of the cell that has water, minerals, all the different proteins, DNA, basically all the constructs of the cell inside of here and all the chemical reactions that basically lead to life. Okay, that's not a very exciting one there just to say, oh yeah, there's something inside the cell. Here's a good one for you, ribosomes. All cells have ribosomes. And every protein that was ever made was made inside of a ribosome because ribosomes make proteins. This is a universal structure amongst all cells. And of course, if we are, are making proteins, you need some information to make those proteins. So of course, all cells have DNA that stores genetic information and they have RNA carrying out various functions uh, with gene expression, like helping those the information to get made into a protein. How much protein do you make? When do you make it? RNA is involved with a lot of that. So there you have it. You know, we've, we've got a cell membrane, cytoplasm, ribosomes, and DNA. Is there more? Of course there is. Of course, there's always more to the story. That's the simple intro to biology uh, textbook answer right there. When you take a biology course, that's typically what you see. However, there is much more to this story than just those four features in common. Let's take a closer look here because it's that closer look to me that gets really exciting, that really points toward this universal common ancestor. And one of them is the genetic code. This is the language of life. You know that DNA stores information. Well, they store that information in their sequence of their building blocks. Their building blocks are called nucleotides. There's four of them, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Now, if you're looking at this chart right here, you're going, wait, there's, there's no thymine, there's no T, there's U. Well, that's uracil. This, of course, is the genetic code for RNA. So this would be copied from DNA, basically. And what happens is a codon, which is a sequence of three of these nucleotides, they code for a specific amino acid. Now, the codons are nearly universal. This is the language of life. So basically the same codon will always code for the same amino acid. That means if I have you know, some genetic information, a gene, and that gene makes a protein, and I put, and I take it from a human, put in a bacteria, it's gonna make the same protein. And in fact, that's how we make human insulin. We extracted uh, the, the gene to make insulin from humans, inserted it into E. coli, and guess what? That E. coli makes human insulin. In fact, uh, in the 1970s, that's how we started making cheap insulin to treat diabetes. So, if the genetic code is universal, then it stands to reason that you're gonna use the same 20 amino acids. And of course, amino acids, these are the building blocks for proteins. So that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Not only do we share those four features I just talked about, but the language of life and the building blocks of life are universal. And once again, that's really good uh, evidence for a universal common ancestor. But there's, there's even more. I know, this gets even better here. All right, there are universally conserved genes. Now, what exactly is a gene? Well, our definition has honestly changed in the last few decades, but genes code for proteins, okay? Or you can have non-coding genes that code for uh, strands of RNA 
that don't make proteins. So we're going to talk about things like messenger RNA, transfer RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, and other genes used for uh, gene regulation. Those are non-coding regions, right? So it goes to without saying that we have these universally conserved genes, basically genes that are the same in every living cell we find. And of course, they're often related to making proteins, which is the process of transcription and translation. And there's some also involved with energy production and transport. I know, isn't that wild? Energy production and transport. So before we talk about energy production and transport, let's talk about the genes involved with making proteins. Okay, so whenever we need to make a protein, you know that uh, DNA stores all the genetic information to make the protein, but the DNA doesn't actually make the protein. So instead, you copy the information as a messenger RNA. This process is called transcription. Then that messenger RNA goes into the cytoplasm. And if you're in a eukaryotic cell, you have to exit the nucleus. If you're in a prokaryotic cell, then you're right there in the cytoplasm and the next step of translation begins. And in translation, this occurs at the ribosome, and that's where the information in the messenger RNA is translated into a polypeptide. You're basically making a protein, right? So you're just translating the sequence of nucleotides into a sequence of amino acids that is our polypeptide that will be then folded into uh, a protein. So uh, you have a lot of different types of non-coding RNA involved with this. One of them, of course, is the transfer RNAs and the ribosomal RNAs. So our RNAs, these are ribosomal RNA and they're involved with making the ribosome. And these are amongst the most conserved sequences in all life. So you go to an archaean, you go to a bacteria cell, you go to a eukaryotic cell, there are sequences of DNA, our genes, to code for these ribosomal RNAs that are remarkably similar throughout all life. Now, there are differences, right? There, there are differences. And in fact, we can define bacteria, eukaryotes, and um, archaeans based on small differences in those ribosomal RNA. But in general, these are ultra-conserved genes or universally conserved genes, I should say. And the next one involved with this are the tRNAs. Transfer RNAs are non-coding RNA. And what they do is they wander around, they kind of float around in the cytoplasm, and they bring amino acids to the ribosome. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, these are incredibly conserved sequences that we find throughout all life. They're involved with making proteins. Because you can imagine that any change here could really affect your ability to make a protein, and there's no way a cell can survive if it can't make proteins. Now, the next set of genes are involved with a process. And remember when I said that, you know, life evolved as an extension of geological processes, likely in these alkaline vents? And if you hear the word alkaline, you're going, you know, that pH is, is high, it's above seven. And, you know, when we go back billions of years into the ocean, we had a lot more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, no free oxygen. So with all of that higher amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, guess what? The oceans were acidic. That means we had natural proton gradients in those thermal vents. There were more protons on the outside, hence in the acidic ocean, than there were protons on the inside that was alkaline. Well, it turns out that every single cell on this planet uses a proton gradient to make ATP. And of course, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the currency or the energy currency of all living things. And the vast majority of ATP is made by a process called chemiosmosis. And chemiosmosis relies on protons pushing their way through a large molecular complex called ATP synthase. And interestingly, right, ATP synthase is found in all cells. It's found in the membrane of all cells. If you're in a bacterial cell, an archaeal cell, 
then you're on the outer membrane. If you are in a eukaryotic cell, then you find ATP synthase in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And in fact, you can also find ATP synthase on the membranes of the thylakoids, the thylakoid membranes, inside the chloroplast, inside of a plant cell, and it's involved with uh, ATP production. So of course, when mitochondria is part of oxidative phosphorylation, making ATP, and in plants, it would of course be photophosphorylation, making ATP. So remarkably, remarkably, portions of this large molecular complex are conserved across all living things. And the reason why is because they all use these proton gradients to make the majority of their ATP through a process called chemiosmosis. And if you don't have a natural proton gradient, then life uses, uh, uh, elect uses uh, proton pumps to basically generate a proton gradient to make ATP. So that's remarkable. And like I said, that stems from the birthplace of life and to me, that's a very compelling evidence, not only for a common ancestry of life, but for the conditions that led to the origins of all life, right? This uh, natural proton gradient inside these alkaline vents. Okay, there's one more. It also turns out that we share various metabolic pathways in common as well. And some people actually believe that metabolism may have come before replication. And there's compelling evidence for that. There's also compelling evidence that metabolism and replication kind of co-evolved. So I'm showing you what is called a, a citric acid cycle. And if you look closely at it, you'll realize that it's adding carbon dioxide to this cycle and it's producing acetylcoenzyme A rather than taking the acetylcoenzyme A and breaking it down into carbon dioxide and generating some ATP. This is a citric acid cycle run in reverse. And it turns out that one of the earliest metabolic pathways ever may have been some version of the Krebs cycle that helped fix carbon dioxide into organic molecules. And even though it's running it in reverse, you'll notice many of the intermediate molecules are similar. And that's important because uh, the Krebs cycle, uh, or the citric acid cycle, I should say, it's the same thing. This is at the heart of our cellular metabolism. And because this is shared by prokaryotes and eukaryotes, that also is indications of its antiquity and uh, yeah, common, common traits, right? So there you have it. Uh, yeah, lots of similarities. There's even more than that. People right now, different labs are doing uh, research, looking into finding you know, how many genes uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes have in common. And they've identified various numbers between hundreds to almost a thousand. It's just that some of those genes, as you go down the list, they become more and more and more different. And that could be a function of different environments, different needs of those cells. But whenever you see something like a process, like uh, chemiosmosis, making ATP synthase, or a metabolic pathway, like a version of the Krebs cycle that's conserved, well, guess what? there's genes involved with making the proteins and regulating those proteins that are also conserved. So there you have it. I, I hope I gave you a little bit more than just those four basic things you find in a textbook and you realize like, yeah, you know, there's, there's some very serious similarities that would almost certainly never have evolved independently of each other the way they have. So there you have it. That's the similarities between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So stay tuned. I'm going to kick out another video here on, on the diversity of prokaryotes. Oh, it'll be a short one because there's just so much to cover. Okay, until next time, stay curious. This has been another episode of Tom Kennedy Science.